This video is sponsored by NordVPN. I use NordVPN via its lovely simple interface to transport myself effortlessly into otherwise region locked content zones, which has been especially useful for catching motorsport and TV content from across the globe. Their thousands of high speed servers have made it pretty painless to just click a server of my choice and be connected in seconds. That's it really. It will work on your desktop or mobile devices and is compatible with most operating systems and even has a lightweight Chrome browser extension. And as you can run six simultaneous connections, you can make sure you're double encrypting your data on every device. Chainbear subscribers can get a 70% off a three year plan, plus an extra month free on top of that by going to nordvpn.org slash chainbear or using coupon code chainbear. That's nordvpn.org slash chainbear. This topic was prompted by an engineer friend of mine, Abhinav who asked me what I think is something of an age old question in Formula One. What's more important, the driver or the car? And this is a very difficult question to unpick as most things are when you have intermingling variables. In a spec series where all the cars are the same or almost the same, we get a clearer idea of who the best driver in the field is as the team can do much less to influence their success. Obviously team members do hard work to give their drivers the best possible chance through things like setup, strategy, coaching, etc. But a huge amount of responsibility for getting points on the scoreboard sits on the shoulders of the driver. In series like Formula 1, where the teams build and develop the cars, causing a margin in performance between the best and worst cars on the grid, the question becomes muddier. Have a look at 1999 to 2004. Would Schumacher have won five world drivers titles without Ferrari? Would Ferrari have won six World Constructors titles without Schumacher? It's not so easy to say, is it? So let's have a look at some data. The Constructors Championship has been running since 1958. In those 62 seasons run since, 53 times the champion driver was in the champion car. Only nine times did a driver win in a, quote, losing car. Which kind of looks like the car makes a lot of difference, right? Drivers are struggling to win without the best car underneath them, clearly. Or do the teams struggle to win without the best driver or drivers racing for them? So let's break this apart a little further. If we chart the championship position of the lead driver of the title winning team, we see they mostly come first overall, you know, winning the double. But sometimes they come second or once even third. But what if we also chart the position of the second driver in that same title winning team? Now it's not as clear cut. So ignoring the occasional massive gaps in results between the two drivers, we can see that the second driver still doesn't always finish runner-up behind their title winning teammate. In fact, just looking at the last 20 championships, at least one driver from another team has finished between the title winning driver and their teammate on 14 different occasions, 70% of the time. If the car was definitely the be all and end all of all performance, its drivers would be finishing 1-2 much more regularly in the overall standings. Now, if we look back one year earlier to 1999, we see quite a big gap where Irvine finished second in the championship, but Schumacher finished fifth. But of course, this is a bit of an unfair statistic, as Schumacher missed six races due to a broken leg and Mika Salo deputised for him. If you add up all the points from both of them, then the second car would have finished third overall, just behind Irvine. Now, I'm not going to do this for every year because that gets a bit messy, but what I can do is set the number one car of the title winning team as a baseline of 100%. I can then plot how many points the second car got in total as a percentage of the lead car's points. So in 2019, Hamilton got 413 and Bottas got 326 points, which is 79% of Hamilton's score. In 1999, Irvine scored 74 points, and Schumacher and Salo in the other car scored a total of 54 points. That's 73% of Irvine's. And so on. The second car here is quite wildly all over the place, sometimes close to a lead car, sometimes not at all. So let's compare this to the lead driver of the nearest rival team. So in 2019, the nearest non-Mercedes rival was Max Verstappen, who scored 278, 64% of Hamilton's points. Tracing this back over the years, we can see that overall, a good driver in the non-championship winning car is matched quite similarly against the second driver in the championship car. So this prompts questions like, in 2018 and 2017, if Mercedes hadn't had Hamilton and instead had two Bottas level drivers, would either of their drivers have won the championship? Or would Vettel have got both of those titles? 
In 2012, Alonso was much, much closer to Vettel than Webber was. Without Vettel, would Red Bull have got the driver's title? Seems very unlikely. And again and again, we see times where a driver from another car is much closer to the lead driver of a championship winning car than their own teammate. And that's part of the reason teams spend huge amounts of money locking down the very best drivers. Now, I need to make this absolutely clear. The data as presented does not present the entire picture. If in 2018 everything was the same except Mercedes had two Bottas level drivers, you couldn't say for certain that Vettel would take the title. We can't say where these two Bottases would finish or how much more successful Bottas might have been without Hamilton in the other seat. That's something we can only speculate. And I want to make clear I'm not saying Bottas is a bad driver at all. He's just, well, he's not Hamilton or Vettel. Not yet, anyway. So you can't just stick any old driver into the best car on the grid and get a championship out of them. And the same is, of course, true the other way around. McLaren stuck one of the very best drivers of the time, Alonso, into their car just as they had one of the worst troughs of performance in their lifetime. And Alonso couldn't do very much with the car at all. Hell, McLaren had two world champions in their team and they still struggled. Which isn't to downplay what a driver can bring to the team. Racing at official events is just part of their job. They work the simulator, help with testing, can galvanise the team, bring in sponsors, attract high tier staff and help transform a team from midfield running to top tier. Schumacher did it with two Ferrari, though not single handedly, obviously. So here's where I fall on the issue of car versus driver. I think it comes down to performance spread. What do I mean by this? Well, in any given season, you could crudely evaluate a team's car on a scale of goodness, from very good to very bad. In 2019, you might arguably lay the teams on an axis of goodness a bit like this, with Mercedes being a step above the rest, Ferrari and Red Bull being good, and Williams and Haas being at the bad end. Other years may vary. Sometimes you get a close pack field where performance is quite tight among the teams. And sometimes you'll get a big spread in performance where the worst teams are practically in a junior series in comparison. Similarly, you could rate the drivers in a crude way, with some of them being the absolute cream of the crop and some of them being a smoking garbage fire who need to be booted back to go-karts. Again, some years have a tighter spread of talent than other years. So why is this important? Well, clearly, if you've got years where the performance of the cars is very spread out, then that has a massive weighting on overall success. So in 2019, you may have been able to argue that Hamilton might still have been able to win a title in a Ferrari or a Red Bull, maybe. But any car below that, and the question is absolutely off the table. But if the field spread was tighter, then you could more easily argue that Hamilton, who was arguably in the form of his life last year, could have dragged a lower performing car towards a championship challenge. Similarly, if the drivers were all fairly closely matched talent-wise then you might be able to argue that Mercedes could have won last year's title with any of a top handful of drivers. But if there's a clear spread in skill, then while you could argue that Vettel could have been champion in Mercedes, you probably wouldn't say the same for, I don't know, let's say Grosjean. And I like Grosjean. <laughs> and this is where I get back to my grand plan of turning F1 communist again. I am quite into the idea of a championship where drivers rotate through teams as the season goes on. It would be a massive departure from F1 as we know it and would require a lot of thought. But think about it. If there are 20 drivers, then each driver can spend two races with each team over the first 20 races. In that span of time, each driver has had to use every different car and every team has run every driver. And while there may be some randomness thrown in with reliability errors, botched pit stops, weather and so on, over time this evens out as much as any other season. So, over these 20 races you've got a really good idea of who the best driver is and who the best team is, because you've evened out the nature of having the best drivers in the best teams. Now you can either run seasons where the number of drivers always equals the number of races, or... After 20 races are complete, you can then put the best drivers in the best cars for the remaining few races for a final showdown. Now in this scenario, you'd have to take driver salaries away from the teams, so the teams don't pay the drivers anymore. Instead, F1 pays drivers on a sliding scale, depending on where they finish, and drivers can still get their own sponsorship and stuff so they can buy their fancy watches or whatever. I don't know, sponsorship might be weird. They can figure that out. This takes some financial load off the teams as they don't have to think, how can I afford a Verstappen anymore? and they can even arrange for special sponsor deals and matchups for when they do know they're having a top-tier driver on board. Teams can focus on the team stuff, 
drivers can focus on the driver stuff. Now, this would never happen, and some purists would hate to see it, but I think this is kind of more pure. There are downsides, like if you're looking for a Leclerc versus Verstappen battle, it might happen less frequently if they're in unmatched cars. But it's statistically unlikely they will frequently be miles apart in performance. Something to think about. That's my video. Stuart out.